All right. So it started a little early, but that's uh, that's okay. All right. I'm in. I just made Ed the presenter. All right. Um, I need to be the presenter. Let me let me do this. Uh, I need to be the presenter because I have the slides. Okay. Uh, let me do that. Okay. All right. Come in. And then we'll get started in a second, my friend. All right. Ed, you got my screen? I do. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. We're starting a couple minutes early. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's, it, that always kind of happens. But we have a a very very special occasion here at at, at Coaster BMS, and uh, Ed Pinto, who I don't know if if everyone has heard about Ed or has um, seen Ed's stuff, is uh, probably one of the the smartest people uh, that I've ever met in regards to housing and housing finance. Um, you guys are, you know, if if if, if there was uh, somebody. Uh, you know, who was around when Albert Einstein was around working on the uh, equations. Um, this would be uh, similar to Ed working on the housing market. And just to give you guys um, uh, some background on Ed, is Ed is a resident fellow of the American Enterprise Institute. Um, he, Ed is co-director of the International Center of Housing Risk. He is currently uh, researching policy options, we're really rebuilding U.S. housing financing its financing sector. It specializes in the effect of government housing policies on mortgage foreclosures and on the availability of affordable homes for the working class. Pinto writes the American Enterprise Institute's monthly housing risk watch, which has replaced the FHA watch, along with the resident scholar Stephen Oliner. Uh, Pinto is a creator and developer of the AI Pinto Mortgage Risk and collateral risk and capital risk indexes. An executive vice president and chief credit officer for Fannie Mae until 1980s, Pinto has done groundbreaking research on the role of federal housing policy in the 2008 mortgage financial crisis. Pinto's work on government mortgage complex includes uh, seminal research papers submitted to Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, uh, and, then, and, and the list goes on and on. Ed, Ed do you want to add anything to that? I mean. No, that, uh, I think uh, we bored people enough, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed, and um, let's go ahead and get started. So, Ed, um, okay, the mortgage market. Brian. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, <clears throat> today I'm going to cover some housing finance principles. They really relate directly to appraising, uh, the way appraising valuation theory, I should say, uh, housing market cyclical nature, the housing finance system versus a market, uh, use of big data, the fact that we basically have two punch bowls in the housing uh, uh, finance system, uh, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, rural housing, the five agencies, uh, housing finance reform, yes or no, question mark, and uh, my conclusion, bullish now, bearish later. Uh, the next slide, please. So slide uh, three, there we go. So uh, you should all be familiar with this. This is uh, real estate markets are cyclical and changing. Uh, this is the uh, representation of a uh, market. It goes through uh, four phases, expansion, contraction, recession, recession recovery. Uh, prices uh, go up, prices start coming down, prices hit bottom, prices recover. Uh, the equilibrium price is a dotted line. Um, the chance of uh, the most probable selling price actually being the equilibrium price is uh, pretty slim. Uh, it only occurs for very certain uh, small periods as it pierces um, these uh, peaks and troughs. Uh, as uh, as time goes on, and it's very difficult to measure that. Uh, but the reality, this is actually how the market is is operating. Uh, in uh, in theory, the next slide, please, shows uh, okay. us how where, it operates. Where are we now in this? By the way, 
Well, I think we're still in the expansion phase. Where in the expansion phase is difficult to say. Uh, I, it, and it beca it's because of two things. One is uh, that the government will endeavor to keep the expansion phase going for as long as possible. Uh, generally with the economy and we see all of the contortions that the Fed goes through and the indecision that they have month after month uh, but also in particular the mortgage industry which is very central to um, what the government you know tries to do in terms of pushing the market always higher uh, eventually they run out of steam uh, something either tick trips it uh, uh, off uh, or you know something happens it could be an international event it could be a recession it could be the price of oil doubles from fifty dollars a barrel to a hundred be any even number of things and that then starts the contraction and then once that contraction starts it tends to continue until you hit bottom the the market doesn't start and stop and switch very often so it has a lot of upward momentum and the government feeds that upward momentum as we'll see Gotcha. So it's hard to say where we are, other than we are strongly in an up, mar up expansion. Got it. Got it. Next slide. So this next slide uh, takes into account these what we call unforgiving price cycles. The, once that turn occurs, <clears throat> you're on the downward slope, and it's very unforgiving because it continues until it, it stops, uh, which the and it usually overshoots uh, to some extent the. Uh, um, if allowed to left to its own devices, it might even overshoot uh, the equilibrium point, um, but then you know starts a recovery um, once things look the darkest uh, is when the recovery starts. And so what this chart uh, tries to show is actual real housing prices, and we look at real housing prices rather than nominal to take out the inflation effect. Uh, and it's really trying to get at fundamentals, real housing prices, uh, are then looking at if inflation is running at 2% and in incomes tend to go up with inflation, maybe a little bit faster. Um, uh, rents tend to go up with inflation. Um, and so by taking inflation out, we're getting a more fundamental view of, of the market. Uh, the, so that's the black line. We're using FHFA back to 1975. We use FHFA because that's the, the best index that goes back the furthest, that's the most consistent and the broadest base. It's not perfect, but it's it's the best of the ones that we've looked at. And then we adjust it using the uh, B, uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis Price Index for Personal Consumption, which is the Fed's uh, favorite uh, uh, inflation adjustment index. And so that's the black line. And then uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the background in color, uh, the gold colors are uh, uh, sellers markets and the blue colors or buyers markets and so you see a strong upward uh, movement on the left side back in the late 70s a, a sellers market then there was a, a buyers market and uh, values uh, house prices and values came down well the prices came down the values uh, is another question whether they really ever went up uh, and then we have the things moving somewhat sideways for a while. That's a little deceiving because those of you in the, in the business a long time may remember 1987, Boston had a housing bust. New York City had a housing bust in 89. California, uh, LA had a housing bust in 91. Riverside, San Bernardino had a very severe housing bust in at the same time. And since these were spread out rather than all happening at once, uh, the uh, trend line gets a little bit elongated. Uh, if we were looking at any given metro like LA, you would see the same kind of blue and orange that we see um, in these other areas that are blue, uh, the, the boom part periods. And then, of course, we have the mother of all boom periods, uh, the 90s and the uh, aught years up to 2006. Uh, and you see the black line going up tremendously that, that uh, swamped all the earlier uh, increases. Uh, and we have um, a seller's market that was in place cons consistently through this entire period. Leverage was increasing consistently through the entire period. And when, as we'll see, when you increase leverage during a seller's market, you get higher home prices. They go up faster than inflation and incomes. Uh, we then had the turn in the market. I would just note the, 
the quick turn. Once a market goes from sellers to buyers, it doesn't keep flipping back and forth. It tends to uh, you know stay in one direction, and uh, and that direction, of course, is then down in a buyer's market uh, as there's more uh, supply than demand. Uh, and then that troughs in mid 2012. A number of things happen in 2012. Credit starts easing, and we can we'll see that you know with the National Mortgage Risk Index tracks that. Uh, we see that the Fed did QE3, uh, and we see the switch from, and it happened at the same time, so it, it wasn't cause and effect. They, the Fed's timing, as usual, is perfect. They, they implemented QE3 just at the time the market was shifting from a buyer's market to a seller's market. So all of that extra juice has driven house prices up pretty smartly. The slope of that uh, line on the far right is actually pretty uh, strong. Uh, we're up 16% in real home prices since the trough, and uh, that's a pretty strong increase. Next slide, please. So uh, is the housing finance a system or a market? A housing market is driven by supply and demand, market dynamics. Uh, it's fundamentally composed of local markets, the realtors, you know, location, location, location. We'll see that that concept goes back 120 years. Um, but our housing finance system, separate from the market, the housing finance part is government-centric and has been for a very long time. It's really been created as an economics-free zone, meaning it's indifferent to supply and demand. It's composed of you know, the alphabet soup of agencies. It has fostered over time a massive liberalization of mortgage terms and provided trillions and trillions in lending in both up and down markets. And that's one of the problems. Uh, the government is indifferent to whether it's an up or down market. It tends to just move forward in, in both. And the problem is when you move forward in an up market that already is feeling jubilant about the recovery and the government adds more leverage uh, through these agencies, you end up fueling the uh, price spike. Uh, and again, that's what happened in the 90s and the early hot years, and I believe it's happening again today. Uh, the GSEs are an integrated and integral part of the system uh, while they've always historically uh, you know, been privately owned since the early 70s, uh, they really, this ownership comes with a lot of strings, uh, so much so that they're really tools of Congress. They're policy tools. And their charters uh, can be amended by Congress. They could be eliminated by Congress. They're completely at the discretion of Congress. Uh, other government policies what do you think, also uh, work. Ed, what do you what do you think Congress is, is is doing right now with housing? What do you think they're because it's at their whim? Well, if we can hold that question. I have a slide that talks about that. Okay, uh, we'll get to that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the end result of all this is that housing has become less, not more affordable or accessible. The home ownership rate in 1957 was about 62 percent. Uh, the home ownership rate today is about 63 and a half. Uh, it hasn't budged except that uh, leverage has gone up by a factor of five or six. When you count uh, leverage in terms of down payment, leverage in terms of credit, leverage in terms of, of uh, debt to income, leverage in terms of loan term. Uh, when you add all that up together, uh, we've got a massive increase in leverage, which is why we now have house prices are increasing you know, faster than incomes. Uh, and so we've gone from about two times income back in the 50s and 60s to about 3.4 times income with many areas, particularly in California and on the East Coast, at six, seven, eight, nine, ten times income. Uh, so next slide, please. So the importance of big data in tra tracking trends, uh, we've created the National Mortgage uh, Risk Index here at AEI. It's 21 million agency loans guaranteed since November 2015. Uh, it's, it's a census of the loans, not a sample. And one of the problems we'll see is when you have a sample and it's a bad sample, you get all kinds of crazy results. So this is a census. It's 98% of all the loans guaranteed by Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, and rural housing. Uh, these agency loans account for 78% by count of all first lien mortgage purchase loans, 85% of all primary purchase loans, and 93% of all first time home buyer. And so from a policy perspective, they really represent the loans that policymakers 
uh, and regulators should be interested in because they're the primary purchase and first-time buyer loans, uh, and the vast majority of them. And the ones that are missing, of course, are largely jumbo, and um, there's less policy issue issue there, uh, policy interest there. Uh, and so we're really focused on the loans that um, uh, in the right you know the right focus. Next slide, please. The reason uh, big data is so important is if you don't have it, you can miss what's going on. So you read in the papers about you know the the lag in first time home buyers and and the mortgage market and this and that. Well, there's a boom going on in the mortgage market. First of all, you have to recognize the seasonal pattern. This chart, um, again, a census of all the agency business, uh, basically shows distinct seasonal patterns. The trough occurs at the same time each year. The peak occurs at the same time each year. You know why? It's schools. Schools and weather. And, and so if you need to get your child into school for an August or September start, you need to be in the house by July or whatever, which means you need to buy it you know, sometime in January or February or March, depending on the weather. Uh, and, you know, that's what's driving this. And so we see, when you have a complete census, we can see uh, these peaks and, and valleys uh, very consistently. We can then track year over year. You don't want to track month over month so much because there's a lot of change month over month that isn't noise. It's actually, again, just the trend. And, uh, and, and so... When we so we look at year over year, and you can see that the the red dots on the black line have been going up, uh, and the blue line represents uh, the first time home buyer volume, uh, and you can see the the y axis doesn't go down to zero. So uh, there's actually the first time home buyers are more than half of uh, the total agency business by count, uh, and we expect uh, we're not at the at the seasonal peak. Uh, which occurs in August. Uh, again, we, we track first payment date. So an August first payment date would be a June closing. Uh, so then the party would move in in June or July. And so with a first payment date of August. Uh, so that, again, makes sense relative to schools. Um, and But we're expecting a first-time home buyer number to be well in excess of the peak in August of 2015, probably on the order of approaching 200,000 uh, loans, and we expect the composite to be approaching 350,000 loans. Um, and so we're, we're looking at a booming market here uh, that, again, this big data shows us what's going on. Next slide, please. So the boom is fueled with high-risk, largely FHA agency first-time buyer lending. Uh, we see the trend line. This is the National Mortgage Risk Index. Uh, we risk rate every loan that's uh, done. We put it into its constituent month based on first payment date. Uh, and that way we're tracking what's going on over time. And uh, you can see the blue line is trending up. Uh, the repeat buyer line is also trending up. Uh, not quite as uh, you know, rapidly, but trending up. The blue line is way above the repeat buyer line, 5.5 uh, percentage points. With these what the index represents is uh, if a loan were under stress as the 2007 uh, uh, cohort year of loans, if it experienced the same economic stress, uh, how many defaults would occur um, over time in roughly five years after the, uh, the loans were seized in five years? And so this basically says if all the first-time home buyers were subjected to that 2007 stress that were just uh, put on the books last month, then about 16% of them would default under stress. That's of all of the first-time home buyer loans. Uh, and then about 10.5% uh, of the repeat buyer loans, the average of the two is something on around 13%. Uh, and so that's not near as extreme as it was in the actual event year. Uh, but it is certainly uh, denotes high risk. We, we define a low-risk loan um, based on some research that uh, some regulators had done a few years back as a loan with a default level of six or below. So you can see that these averages are well above six. Uh, you, in order to have a stable housing market, uh, one where the foreclosures don't go out or go crazy when uh, you come under price pressure, and you're, and you're not increasing that uh, price uh, 
distortion. Um, we, we think that a substantial portion or predominant portion of the loans need to be low risk. Today, that is not the case. Uh, we're already at a point where only about 35% of the loans are low risk. The rest are medium and mostly high risk. High risk is the, the largest bucket, largely due to FHA and first-time buyers. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, shows how um, the risk builds over time. It's measuring the difference in the mortgage risk index year over year. Um, and so this goes back 41 months. Of course, uh, it starts at the, the um, uh, 29th month, but then it's a year before, so it's a total of 41 months. And so we've had a credit easing trend for 41 months, which just about goes back to the date that the uh, Fed started loosening, a little bit after that, that point. Uh, so that's uh, one of the features that on that earlier chart that showed the seller's market, uh, we have a seller's market, we have the Fed's easing, uh, which continues, and we have um, the increasing uh, leverage that the uh, risk index measures. And so we're uh, seeing a uh, consistent increase. It varies. Sometimes there's a little seasonal pattern. Um, varies. Uh, First-time home buyers generally are increasing faster than the repeat buyers, which is then widening that spread. Um, and so uh, this is a, a, a key trend that we watch um, in conjunction with you know, the seller's market, which there's been a seller's market the entire time uh, of this chart. Next slide, please. So there's another data accuracy uh, check and why big data is important. So again, we have 98% of all the agency loans. Uh, we have 98% of all the Gini May loans. Um, and so the, uh, we looked at FICO scores below 700. I, actually, there was a newspaper article four or five months ago uh, that talked about how the number of loans below 700 was declining. Uh, and I'm going, wait a minute, that's not true. And the reason they said it was declining was because they were using the blue line data. Uh, the blue line data comes from CoreLogic. Uh, and it shows uh, you know, a decline. Uh, that's because, there, as we'll see, there's been a big shift away from large banks to smaller, uh, to non-banks and smaller non-banks. And uh, that shift can't be kept up with in terms of a database that's based on a survey of a relatively small number of uh, lenders and issuers. Um, again, we're, we're capturing 98% of all of the uh, loans, and so we've got the complete census, and so we show, again, that seasonal pattern with a very distinct, uh, even greater upward trend um, as compared to the blue line in both cases, which shows a minimal seasonal pattern and a downward trend. Uh, Gini, of course, accounts for most of the loans. Uh, most recently, over 40,000 of the roughly 60,000 were Gini, uh, below 700, uh, and uh, again, uh, we're seeing a you know big increase in uh, the Gini loans below 700. Uh, so again, just pointing out the, the need for big data in order to get accurate data so then you're making policy decisions based on the real facts, not uh, mistaken facts. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of uh, punch bowl number one, I mentioned earlier there are two punch bowls. Uh, the Fed is a punch bowl. And actually, the calling it a punch bowl goes back to William McChensley Martin, who was the longest standing Fed chairman from about 1951 to the 70s, early 70s sometime. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Building is named after him. And he gave a very famous speech in 1955 up in New York and basically said the job of the Fed is like the chaperone at a party uh, he has to take the punch bowl away just when the party gets going. And that's historically been the role of the Fed up until relatively recently. And as we can see uh, from all the deliberations that the Fed's going through, they're having a very hard time deciding when to take the punch bowl away. And, uh, but the historical precedent is useful. Because what we have today, which is quantitative easing, we've had for five or six years, um, even yeah, about seven years, um, that quantitative easing, there's a historical 
precedent for that. And that precedent was the Fed's interest rate peg uh, that uh, was in effect from World War II through the early 1950s. And it was basically designed to make it easier for the government to finance World War II. But once World War II was over, they kept the peg for many more years, six more years, because what the peg did was it kept the price of the bonds at par. And the way the peg worked was the Fed would agree to buy from the Treasury all the bonds necessary to keep the price at par and keep the interest rate from rising. So if the uh, Treasury bonds were at 2 percent and the pressure was for interest rates to rise, the Fed would buy enough of those bonds, the new issuances and, and bonds on the market, to keep the price uh, at that peg or that par price. Um, and Tr President Truman didn't want uh, the individuals that bought war bonds to suffer uh, with declining values of their war bonds. Of course, the problem was that became a huge distortion to the economy, and the Fed said, we've got to end this sometime, and it ended in 1951. So long-term interest rates, starting in about 53, uh, rose about two percentage points uh, from 53 to 62, but um, there, I was reading in some appraisal handbooks that uh, this had no impact on home buyers, uh, and that's a curious statement. If interest rates go up, it has no impact on home buyers, and the reason was that FHA accommodated the increase, and that was through acts of Congress. The Congress amended the National Housing Act five times from 54 to 61, increasing FHA's LTV and loan term limits. Uh, these changes, along with rising housing DTIs, kept buying power constant from 53 to 62. Today, the Fed is trying to tighten. It's tightened the first little uh, bit, but it's trying to tighten more and it's having problems. If long-term interest rates rise, my expectation would be that the, the Fed will increase interest rates and, again, the agencies will accommodate. And uh, this would be a risky step um, and uh, because it would involve potentially FHA lowering their premiums again, and we'll see the, the distortions that created in a minute, and it would boost debt-to-income ratios higher. They're already high. It would boost them substantially higher uh, to levels that they were last at in 2007. Uh, these are very risky steps. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, punch bowl number two is, are the agencies themselves. Uh, so the Fed can manipulate interest rates and the agencies can manipulate leverage. And so they have their black boxes, uh, FHA's uh, uh, has their sc total scorecard, Fannie and Freddie, DU, LP, etc. And what we do, because we have a complete census, we're able to reverse engineer in effect the black box because we have what the output is of every loan. And so what this shows is um, for the month of May with April as April 2013 as a comparison, <clears throat> what the distribution is of all the loans that uh, were done in May 2016 by uh, uh, total housing debt ratio percentage points, the percent of income. And so less than 20 percent, 20, 21, all the way up to greater than 57 percent. These are all pre-tax numbers. The top chart shows the distribution for the entire U.S. Um, the lightish pink is Ginny May. The dark uh, pink is the GSEs. And the blue line goes back a few years. Um, what you see is sort of like a wave that builds. And the uh, dark pink line gets above the blue line. Uh, as it moves from left to right and then splashes over and eventually cascades down on the other side and then can, continues to build at a higher level than the blue line. Uh, first takeaway here is <clears throat> you'll notice at 43 percent nothing much happens. Well 43 percent is the qualified mortgage limit on debt to income ratios but all five agencies are exempt one way or another and therefore it has no impact and so we don't see a real impact until greater than 45 percent, and it's largely with the GSEs. We see another impact at greater than 50 percent, and it's uh, both with the GSEs where they drop basically to zero, 
at above 50, and uh, there's also a, a drop um, for FHA or the Ginnie Mae, largely FHA. And then we see the FHA, Ginnie Mae drop at 50, after 57. And again, these are pre-tax. When you look at the bottom, it's California. If you want to know what the future is, go to California. And this tells us the future. So now the blue line is the U.S. in uh, May, excluding California, and uh, the gold, dark gold of the GSEs, California and Ginny is the lighter gold. And we see higher peaks relative to California versus the rest of the country. We see a much bigger wave, much bigger washing over uh, the cliffs, so to speak. And we see that FHA, and this is really the distinctive thing, not only did the GSEs accommodate this, but FHA is, uh, again, being the primary, the, the largest piece of Ginny, is pretty much indifferent above a 40, uh, 4, 45 debt to income ratio. That line is pretty flat until you get uh, below, you know, above 57 when it, when it drops uh, off. But even at, at 57, it, it's much larger than it is. Um, remember the scale is different on the y-axis. It's much larger than it is in the, in the higher one, uh, the one above. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is a quick uh, slide on ratio of sales price, first time buyer to repeat buyers. This is part of the research we've been doing on the effect of the FHA premium drop. That premium drop uh, had a ripple effect throughout the entire housing market in many different directions. One of them is uh, the price of first-time home buyer houses uh, went up relative to repeat buyer houses. And you see uh, this blue line was pretty constant at 72, 73, give or take, uh, for quite a while. And then all of a sudden, coincidental with the increase in the premium early in 2015, excuse me, the decrease in premium early in 2015, it started going up sharply. The changes that this shows, you know, this is an index that doesn't change very much. It bounces around within a narrow range. All of a sudden, it goes way out of the range. And uh, so it's clearly related to FHA's premium change. And as we'll see, it, it relates to the ability of the FHA borrowers to buy more expensive houses, uh, but we'll see that has a number of components to it in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, agency origination shares, you also see FHA's origination share, the red line took a big boost up uh, at, at when the uh, premium change kicked in again. The premium was announced in January, the first loans really closed in February, those really become April first payment dates. And so that's uh, basically the chronology. Uh, they took huge share from rural housing. We'll see more on that in a minute. They took some share from Freddie. They took a fair amount of share from Fannie. And we'll see more on that in a minute. The point is, this change was instantaneous. The market share change was insane. The mortgage, the, the real estate market views the mortgage market as a single market. Um, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA. Now, VA has a somewhat of a special niche. Rural has a somewhat of a special niche. But rural was not immune. They lost half their market share. Um, and so the, the real estate agents, the builders, the sellers, they, they're indifferent to who finances it largely. And so when one financing agency makes it more attractive, the business moves in that direction until it reaches a steady state. It does so very, very quickly, as this chart demonstrates. Next slide, please. So uh, Ed Golding, FHA's chief, uh, testified a while back, we tend to be in different markets. Not true. FHA gained market share in all price tiers for first-time buyers. So this, we broke uh, the market into roughly three equal price tiers, less than 150, 150 to 250, greater than 250. FHA was the big winner in each case, as you see from the red bar, uh, positive red bar. Uh, and rural was the big loser in the, the lowest price tier. Uh, Fannie and, uh, uh, was a, a modest loser. Uh, not much change at VA and Freddie. Uh, when uh, you go to the middle tier, FHA again, big winner. Rural, relatively the big loser. Fannie, still a, a loser, getting to be a larger loser. Again, Freddie not uh, too much impacted. You get to the high-priced homes above 250. Uh, again, FHA, big winner, uh, Fannie and, and Freddie, losers. 
rural, minor loser. They're not a big participant in that section of the market. And again, VA had little impact in general. So um, again, this shows what happens and why this is, it shows that it's an integrated market. And so the fact that FHA doesn't underwrite for risk, doesn't price for risk, and then can manipulate its premium and do other things has an impact on the entire market and can spread this leverage throughout the entire market, not just from a, a catch-up perspective, from a competitive perspective, but it actually becomes a larger player in the market as the prior shows and this slide shows where the volume comes from. Next slide, please. So uh, you hear a lot about the over 95 to 97% business, which technically means over 95 LT, CLTV uh, purchase loan market. We've been tracking this for a long time. Uh, the GSEs in December uh, announced, December 2014, <clears throat> announced an expansion of coverage up to 97% CLTV effective uh, that month. They brought a knife to the uh, affordable housing rumble. FHA brought a bazooka. And again, going back to the uh, share chart, FHA took a tremendous amount of share from Fannie in particular. We'll see why Fannie in particular, because Fannie of anyone was doing, relative to Fannie and Freddie, was doing more of the over 95 and even of the over 90 business they were doing more. It's not shown on this chart. But if you um, notice on uh, the top chart shows where the shift is occurring between Fannie, Freddie, and FHA. So the gray is FHA uh, and uh, the orange is Fannie and the blue is Freddie. So you see very little blue up in that upper uh, panel because Freddie uh, in the lower panel uh, you can confuse it with the x-axis at zero. Uh, Freddie looks like the x-axis. It barely gets above the x-axis uh, in terms of uh, share or numbers. These are numbers. Uh, so you don't see much activity by Freddie up above you see a battle back and forth between Fannie and FHA, and you see uh, FHA winning the battle, and that shows out in the below, and you see FHA has got the uh, gray line, the gold lines, the total. Fannie's down at the bottom, better than uh, Freddie in terms of volume, but nothing huge. Uh, and, and so their, their efforts heretofore have been pretty minimal relative to what FHA is doing, and, and this chart's a really good depiction of that. Uh, next uh, slide, please. FHA price appreciation, uh, price acceleration, some new analysis. This is brand new analysis. We haven't even released some of it yet. Um, we've been tracking the effect of the FHA premium drop since it occurred in January 2014. Um, and economic theory tells you that if you, uh, and this goes back to Ernest Fisher 1951, if you uh, loosen a credit term, which could be dropping interest rates, dropping mortgage insurance premiums, uh, extending loan terms, uh, reducing down payments, anything that liberalizes uh, credit and allows you to get more house with the same amount of resources uh, is a loosening. If you loosen credit during a seller's market, a significant portion of that will go to, in fact, a majority will go to, one, uh, a pure price increase. The houses that get bought will cost more than they would have cost if it weren't for the change. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Secondly, the buyers will buy more home. They'll buy a somewhat larger home. They'll buy a large home on a larger lot. They'll buy a different home that might cost more in a different location. Lastly, you'll bring new entrants into the market. And, but in a seller's market, that will be the smallest piece of the puzzle. And so we actually got data that enabled us to uh, test these uh, uh, principles that Fisher had tested and done uh, with data back in the 40s and early 50s, we were able to test it again. We had a control. The control was Fannie and Freddie. They didn't change anything. Interest rates were interest rates for both. Whatever was going on, interest rates was happening for both. And so we, we had the control group, Fannie and Freddie, and we had FHA as the group we were studying. 
And so we looked at the group before the change and the group after the change. Uh, we got tons of data uh, on the transactions and the square footage of the houses and the location of the houses and the size of the lots. And the, we had AVMs and we could compute the price uh, before and the price after. Uh, it, you know, to, to tell the pure price effect, we could compare um, the houses before and after using the AVM to check the size difference. And what we found was that uh, about a quarter of the price acceleration ends up being about 1.1 percent across the board um, uh, increase in prices for the FHA buyers. Now this is every FHA buyer has to pay this higher price. Um, and, and so they're all paying what's in effect a tax on uh, the homes that they're buying compared to the price of the GSE finance homes. And this is just pure price pressure. They paid 1.1 percent more than they would have paid compared to the GSE borrowers who are the control uh, than if FHA had not lowered the premium. Uh, that's a lot of money on $175,000. It's about $2,000 in price. And again, it's pure price impact that isn't really reflected by in the value. It's just pushing up the price because of the financing. About three quarters of uh, the acceleration uh, was buying bigger, better homes or better neighborhoods. For example, they bought, we were able to calculate that they bought homes that were about um, uh, 70 square feet larger. They were able to buy lots that were about 2,000 square feet larger. They were able to buy uh, homes in different locations that we could uh, show the shift was more like the locations for Fannie Freddie loans. Remember, there was all this poaching going on, so you'd expect a lot of this would, would actually be loans that would have been Fannie Freddie that are now FHA. Um, and, um, and so, in effect, this MIP cut, the mortgage premium cut, would, did not expand access particularly. Uh, the main benefit, which is the main benefit FHA cited, but it actually went to this price effect, either pure price or quantity, quality price. So we then went to question two which is how accurate was FHA's prediction that the cut would spur, quote, 250,000 new home buyers uh, to buy their first home uh, over three years, or 83,000 loans uh, homes per year. Using our NMRI data set, we were able to determine that there were 37,000 new home buyers in the first year, um, not 83. Uh, that they poached 110,000 loans from Fannie, Freddie, the VA, and rural housing, three times as many as the new entrants, and there were another 70,000 uh, gain that was due to pre-existing market trends. The market was already going up before FHA did this. So, of course, when FHA takes credit for this, they will just talk about these big numbers. They will not divide it up into the three constituent parts, as we've done, which we've done very accurately to show uh, exactly what happened. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly go through these next few slides. Uh, this uh, shows uh, refi origination shares. Uh, it says purchase. The, this is actually a, uh, the wrong slide. Uh, the, the purchase went from the large banks having about 70% share to about 20, and the non-banks did the reverse from about 20 to about 70. Uh, apologize for the wrong slide, but you get the picture. Uh, and we'll look, go to the next slide, which shows individual lenders. Uh, this shows for purchase how the, it shifted from large banks away from large banks to non-banks, and how the large banks have a much lower risk profile as measured by our mortgage risk index. So you have U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, uh, and then followed by others. The uh, the other large banks are, the, the dots are getting very small. Uh, J.P. Morgan has virtually vanished. Uh, they went from being the third largest lender to just being a very small dot. Uh, conversely, the large banks, the dots are getting larger, and the dots uh, are of the orange and red color predominantly, which represents higher risk as opposed to the green. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the slide that was up. Uh, at, uh, actually, this got reversed, so uh, I apologize. This is the purchase. So the other one was the refi, and it showed uh, the uh, uh, non-banks having a 90% share. Let me just go back to that refi issue for a moment. That's very significant. The banks had servicing of 60% of that market, 
And when the refi waves of a few years ago came through, the banks weren't interested at all in, in handling those refinances. Uh, that's the only explanation for how they go from that to having less than 10% share in refi. In the purchase, they have about a 20% share that's largely their customers, largely retail. Um, and the non-banks have over 70%, and we can see on the right side how the risk indexes are much higher for the non-banks than they are for the large banks. The large banks uh, have basically kept a pretty constant, it's gone up and down, but over time it's a constant credit uh, footprint in uh, the, the uh, uh, purchase, whereas the, the non-banks have uh, uh, been a steady upward uh, climb in terms of uh, the indices. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a similar for uh, the large lender uh, share uh, and uh, risk share for refinance loans. You see the same pattern. Uh, the large banks uh, have downsized in their volume. They tend to be green. Uh, the non-banks have increased their volume. With the exception of Quicken, they tend to be uh, orange or red. Uh, and those are the you know the trends that we're seeing. Uh, we're we're at a point where we're probably at the near irreducible minimum uh, of uh, their shares. But this is having you know big impacts on policymakers and regulators. Ginny May announced a, a week or two ago that they're going to have a summit on non-bank liquidity issues. When we first started reporting this issue uh, a, a year and a half ago. Uh, it was greeted with some of what of a ho hum. Oh, it's not a big deal. Uh, and Ginny May quickly, in a matter of a few weeks, changed their position on that. And now they're at a point where they're really concerned about the liquidity issue because non banks have a different liquidity structure, very different than than banks. Next slide, please. Aggregate default risk. This just shows that FHA is the repository of risk in the market today. Um, they account, if, if we were to have a stress event, our estimate is the loans that were originated in May 2016, after five years, about 18,000 FHA loans would go into default, um, versus, that's just for that month, at, versus a total of about 32,000. So 54% of uh, all of the, the, uh, the risk is in FHA. And uh, that they're only account for 29% of the loans, but they're accounting for the lion's share of the risk. And we see that trend continuing. Uh, and as I'll discuss in a moment, we see FHA share actually going up in the future. Next slide, please. So this gets to uh, your question, Brian. Finally, housing finance reform. Don't expect the GSEs to end conservatorships, exit conservatorships soon. Don't expect Congress to do anything soon with one or two possible exceptions. Uh, it's hard for Congress to get to an agreement. They're really deadlocked over a number of issues. Number one is the guarantee itself. Uh, the House uh, uh, Financial Services Committee reported out uh, a no government guarantee bill. Uh, the Senate Finance Committee reported out a government explicit government guarantee bill. They couldn't be farther apart. They also are very far apart on the affordable housing goals. Johnson Crapo foundered over that. Um, never went to the Senate floor. Um, and the reason that's an issue is the progressives on, uh, in the Senate and the progressives in the House want a duty to serve. Beyond the affordable housing goals themselves, they want an affirmative duty to serve uh, imposed on Fannie, Freddie, or whoever the replacements are. Uh, we don't have time to go into why that's a bad idea. You get the, the drift of if you uh, start pushing more leverage in a seller's market, all you're going to do is keep driving prices up and eventually get further away from the, uh, the mean, and then that mean reversion it gets more and more painful. So Congress responds to deadlines, reacts to co uh, crises. There are none at the moment uh, that are uh, present for ending conservatorship. There's no limit on the conservatorship. The GSE's charters are perpetual. The loan limits are self-implementing, the increases. The QM patch it, it doesn't expire until 2021, January but it can be extended at the stroke of a pen by the CFPB uh, director. Treasury's senior preferred stock agreement is irrevocable, has a 30-year term that evergreens frequently, uh, and it covers $270-something billion in losses uh, between Fannie and Freddie. Uh, so there's a lot in place that 
takes away any uh, need for Congress to do something. Uh, the one exception, there's a lot of discussion about recap and release. Um, I don't think there's any appetite either in Congress or in the administration for a recap and release. That means let Fannie and Freddie accumulate a lot of capital out instead of uh, uh, passing along through the sweep, the dividend sweep, and then eventually get released from conservatorship. I just don't see that happening. I do think there's an easy way of dealing with the issue that's being uh, focused on is why you need recap and release, and that is what happens if there was a quarter where Fannie or Freddie lost some money because of hedging. Uh, there's a simple answer to that. Instead of sweeping quarterly, sweep annually. That would take care of it for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so, next slide, please. Okay, uh, key takeaways of the overall is FHA is the marginal guarantor. I think its share which is now 29% could, could hit 35 in one to two years. Uh, I think they will likely lower their premiums again this year. I don't think that's a good policy for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is it'll drive house prices up for FHA borrowers again and push FHA borrowers into even larger houses again. Uh, the new credit scoring methods that get talked about, the the credit invisible and the credit unscorable. You hear numbers, 25 million, 35 million people in those categories. Uh, the reality is those individuals largely have poor credit. The median uh, FICO score of the group with the, uh, the 35 million that gets talked about is 550. Uh, the median FICO score in the country is 712. Uh, and so 550 is really at the bottom. Uh, yes, there are some in the 700s, but they're relatively few and far between. Uh, to any, to a, the extent it plays into any agency, it plays into FHA, hence my point that FHA share will grow yet again. Um, loan leverage, particularly first-time homebuyers, will continue to grow. The non-banks are perfectly willing to do that. They're primed to do that. That's, they view that as their reason for existing, and it fits well with FHA's goals and Ginnie Mae's goals. Uh, community financial institution share will likely continue to decline as will, uh, you know, eventually will reach a steady state, but I don't see any recovery in the bank share, either small or large banks, because the market has moved a lot since they exited. They've been exiting for three and a half years, and the market has moved at a much too much higher risk level. Uh, the FHA, affordable housing goals, duty to serve, CRA, all drive a slow motion race to the bottom. Uh, Fannie and Freddie dominate the refi market, but uh, refis can be very risky as the uh, real estate cycle is moving towards its peak and cash out becomes very popular and there's a natural push to move out the risk curve, which is what happened last time, uh, and I would see it happening again. This uh, unforgiving home loan cycle then sets the stage for another slow motion train wreck. I'm not saying it's going to be as bad as last time. I'm just saying all of the pieces are in place to have this slow motion train wreck. And I say slow motion because as you see from all of the data that I've presented, this is the proverbial frog in the pan of water put onto a slow boil. Uh, it's unnoticeable to the frog. It may be unnoticeable to you. But there are distinct changes occurring that you can see when you have the complete data census and you're measuring it month by month and comparing year over year. Um, so uh, I think the last slide, please. Uh, so bullish now, bearish later. Home purchase lending and leverage have been increasing, uh, and banks have been exiting. Expect the leverage increase to continue. There's minimal a income, asset, and credit constraints on the housing market. QM is not a constraint on the housing market. We've already seen that it's not a constraint on DTI. There is no credit requirement for QM and there's no LTV requirement for QM. Uh, the GSEs are ill-suited to compete with FHA, nor should they be, uh, but we see that and therefore the, the, there's going to be this competition, but again, the GSEs bring a, uh, a knife to the rumble and FHA brings a bazooka. Uh, that won't stop FHA or G the GSE's regulator from pushing them, but it, it's, they're ill-suited. Uh, so bullish in the short term may be the median, and we're talking years potentially, uh, unless some external event were to occur, but bearish in the long term due to mean reversion. The longer this goes, the more uh, the mean reversion becomes 
more of a problem. With that, we'll take questions. Uh, with it, well, yeah, that was a uh, um, you know, definitely a wealth of information. Uh, one question we have is, uh, what would uh, you said the home affordability has been lower? Um, what would and I got to pull up the list of questions real quick. Um, what would a home affordability index look like? Well, I, I like to use. Uh, income divided by, excuse me, sales price, median sales price divided by income. And you can look at that by tiers, but that's a general looking at the median of each. Uh, takes away the interest rate issue. Because a lot of the indexes uses the interest rate, but the interest rate isn't normal. If you've got the Fed suppressing rates through quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy, uh, you basically are driving up prices. And then if rates go up, you're going to have to do something to compensate for it. Either rates have to come down or you have to greatly increase leverage, as I mentioned. So I prefer to look at just the simple metric of median house price divided by median income. We've looked at that nationally. We look at it market by market. And as I said, nationally, we're at about 3.4 times. Uh, two used to be the norm. Three, which can, you know, when the Affordable Housing Act was uh, uh, provisions of the Safety and Soundness Act were passed in 1992, uh, the the uh, index was at 2.9, and Congress thought that wasn't good enough. Uh, and what did they do? They ended up driving it to I think four and a half, uh, and then it collapsed back to 2.9. Uh, we're back up to 3.4, but California's uh, San Francisco's at 9.8, I believe. Etc. So uh, affordability is is okay today, but it's okay today largely because interest rates are at their historic lows, um, and um, uh, and that's what's making it you know for and down payments are also very low. Seventy percent of first-time home buyers have down payments of five percent or less. So the, you know, the the credit is fairly uh, is is not tight. It's actually quite loose. Uh, yes, there's, it's tighter on the credit side, but uh, credit is the big variable that really, when you put it with low down payments and high debt ratios, you really start uh, the credit risk grows astronomically. So that's my that's my best uh, tool for uh, judging affordability. And where do you think? So the so, so the, the was it sixty four thousand dollar question? When is um, when is rates going to rise? When are rates going to rise? Well, I had said about a year ago that, and this was when everyone was saying rates were going up, rates were going up, rates were going up. I said the odds of rates going up are the same as the odds of rates going back down to where they, they're low. And we just touched the low last week. The low meaning uh, the 10-year Treasury got down to its low point in this cycle, which has been going on since 2008, but that treasury rate is lower than it's ever been. Uh, so it actually goes back you know, 100 and something years. Um, and so the reason for that is there's just a lot going on uh, in the world and in the United States. Um, we've got um, Japan is doing absolutely nothing. They've been in a stall and a decline since the early 1990s. Uh, we've got China. We've got um, the Europe, uh, we've got all of the Brexit, uh, we've got all these things going on. And then the United States, while we've had a recovery, everybody talks about how it's a very modest recovery. GDP is growing the slowest of any recovery we've ever had post-World War II. Uh, jobs are growing fairly slowly. They're growing, but it's fairly slowly. They're fairly low-paying jobs, all of those things. Incomes have been growing very slowly. House prices have really been the bright spot. House prices have been going up uh, five, six, seven, eight percent. We're off of the ten percent increases of a year or two ago, or two years ago, but we're still running five, six percent. Some places even more. And so that's been the story. Given that story, um, the Fed uh, should be raising rates, but given that it doesn't want to disrupt the housing market, because the housing market is the bright spot. Therefore, it's going to keep demurring. Uh, and so I think if rates go up, they're going to go up very slowly. 
Uh, will they go up again this year? Maybe, maybe not. Again, I, I think the Fed, when they say they're data-driven, they're minutely data-driven. They, they, they wait for the news in the morning before they decide what they're going to do in the afternoon. They have no grasp of the overall market. When you look at the data we're presenting here, you don't see any big jerky changes from you know one month and the next, particularly if you look at year over year. These trends have been going on for a number of years. We expect the trends to continue. We know what would make them stop. The Fed acts as if everything they decide it has to be based on what they just learned this morning and what they had for breakfast. So that's my that's my call on it. Got it, got it, got it. So rates rates will continue to remain flat because the media is, is running a circle. Any 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 thoughts on uh, if uh, the presidential uh, race is going to affect housing at all? Uh, I, I think the short answer, maybe not much. <laughs> uh, I don't think, given everything that's on the plate of the federal government, regardless of who's elected, um, the, the, the housing, I know it's front and center for everyone on this call. I hate to tell you something, it's not in Congress. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you that because you've told me that a couple times. So give me the you know Reader's Digest version of how Congress sees the housing market relative to the other stuff. I mean, on their priority list, where is it? Well, it's not on it, uh, so it doesn't see it. So I, I go back to the slide that I said Congress responds to crises and deadlines. Got it. There are no crises or deadlines with housing right now. If there were a collapse in the housing market, would Fannie and Freddie go out of business? No. There's a $270 billion line of credit sitting there. If, um, is, is there any, you know, is, is being in conservatorship for five more years a problem? No, there's no limit. There's nothing that says they have to come out. Um, uh, you know, is there any danger of the the patch going away? Not with the current, you know, administration and people at the CFPB. Um, it just takes a stroke of a pen. Congress has delegated everything away. <clears throat> There's nothing they have to do to keep the party going. And so that means they're going to focus on things that are more critical, meaning deadlines, you know, public pressure. If you take a survey, the public isn't clamoring for it. Got so it. So it basically falls off the radar. Got it. Got it. And, and they're completely they're completely divided on what to do. Guarantee, yes, no. Uh, more affordable housing, yes, no. Uh, you know, it's just a completely divided issue, so you can't even get consensus. How do you have a consensus around government guarantee, yes, no? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely I completely understand that. And, and, and may I ask you this uh, uh, last question. Um, when will the uh, non-QM market take off like it said it's going to take off? When will interest rates rise? Uh, <laughs> when will the GSEs come out of conservatorship? I think the answer to all three is, is a pretty long time. Um, I, I think the reason the QM market um, isn't coming back is pretty simple. How do you compete with FHA? Got it. Now, I, I, you know, yes, there's a certain piece of the market, you know, jumbo, QM, and this and that, uh, but that's not a huge part of the market to begin with. Um, it, you know, how, how do you compete with FHA on down payment? How do you compete with FHA on debt to income? You can't. FHA is at 57 percent. Got it. Uh, my my question, this is a good question. With FHA on credit. Yeah. Okay, so last question. Um, and this is a complicated question, so Ed, be ready. Uh, I have seen <laughs> charts from 1970 plus showing increasing affordability with income increasing faster than housing prices, much better than historic norms, setting the stage for rising prices. And so far, purchases, purchasers could manage increasing prices. 
Then when affordability worsened and began exceeding historical norms, prices flattened in reverse course. Is this an incorrect analysis? So you have a chart that shows that over time I'll affordability put, is improving. I'll, I'll put the question on the uh, on the screen so everyone can see it because it's a somewhat yeah. good question. You see, because if you look at it from an interest rate perspective, then affordability is probably improving. But that's only because we've taken interest rates from eight or nine percent in the '70s. I remember buying my first house at you know nine percent in 1975 to three and a half or whatever percent today. Uh, is that real? Is that you know, or is that just um, you know more leverage in another form? Uh, again, if you track um, uh, home prices rel or income, uh, excuse me, incomes, uh, home prices relative to median incomes, then uh, the trend is clear. Uh, you know, house uh, the affordability has been going down over time. Uh, it reached, however, it, it got really bad um, in, 2000, in the 2000s, the late 90s, in the 2000s. It improved, uh, but never, it did not improve back to where it was in the 70s. Again, it was about 2.9, 2.8 in the 70s, and then it was about 2.9 in 1991, and it increased to uh, 6 point something times. So if if a house was 600, it was uh, 300 thousand dollars. Median income would be 50, so that's a six to one ratio. And then it dropped back to around three uh, in 2012, and now it's back to 3.4. Um, so it, it's still uh, and it's still quite a bit higher than it was in the 70s when it was around 2.8. Um, but there are many markets that are at you know nine or eight or seven. California used to not be a super, super expensive market back in the 70s. Uh, but again, if you look at the same chart and you say, now I'm going to take into account interest rates, so I'm going to calculate the monthly payment on that house based on today's interest rates and then divide, you know, and calculate that relative income, you get what the realtors have and you're going to get increasing affordability. It all, you know, as, um, as Harry Truman said, uh, you know, numbers don't lie, you know, you have what? Uh, you have uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics, um, and uh, you know that that's it depends on how you want to look at the at the statistics. Got it, got it, got it. Well, thank you so much, Ed. I mean, this has been so valuable. I mean, I learned so much. I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, this will be recorded. This has been recorded. And uh, I mean, Ed, thank you so much for all you're doing in the housing. And my pleasure. And, and it's amazing, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank sure. you for the yeah. opportunity. Thank you, buddy. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye.